Hi there, this is Mubali. So I wanted to go ahead and walk you through what's going on for my uh, live performance uh, that I will be featuring at Jacunda Trance Festival in Brazil. Uh, this is a very long performance. This is the longest personal performance. This is the longest performance I've done playing all my own material uh, in this concept of a live performance situation. I've done performances where it's like a combination of a live set and DJ set, but not where it's more hybridized, where I can go in and out of full compositions into things that have not even been created fully yet. So I wanted to give some people some perspective on how I'm going to approach this. Now, the way that this thing is working out, it's, um, there's a few factors that you have to take into consideration. One, it's a six hour performance. So you have to make sure that A, you can like, keep the dance floor moving and it not sound boring for a six hour period. So, secondly, since it is a live performance, I really wanted to showcase uh, a, an, experience, an experience that is one of those you would have had to have been there type things where, I mean, it might not sound the same way that same way ever again. Uh, so, I wanted to find a balance between the, that, those two things because trying to make it something where it's completely unique for six hours is very, very difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just not at that level currently. So, here's what I decided to do. Uh, in my case, I have a very large catalog of compositions. I've been writing music for over 15 years, and as we will see, I have a lot of songs, like about 170, give or take. So one of the things that I did to kind of give myself an, an understanding of, okay, how much music are we talking about here in the context of a six hour performance? One of the things that I did is I just kind of did a little bit of a calculation and I'll show you what I did. I'll pull up the calculator. So there are 60 minutes in an hour and there's six hours, so 60 times six is going to be 360. So this is 360 minutes. Now what I'm doing is I am making a ballpark average of how long I would want a composition to play more or less. I give a rough estimate because you know, you're gonna play, some songs are gonna be longer, some songs might be shorter. So I give myself, let's say at, let's say we play about seven minutes a song. So we're gonna take 360, we're gonna divide that by seven, and we're gonna get about 51.42 and some, some change. So we're gonna be playing about 51 songs here. So that's important to think about. And that was the first challenge that I came up with was, okay, I got to play 51 songs. A, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna find out what to play and how am I gonna keep it to where I kind of have a better idea of what's been played so I don't like forget, I don't accidentally play something that I don't, that I've already played. And so I came up with, I started thinking about it and on my launch pad, I have the ability to scroll down by groups, by single uh, scenes or by as much as eight scenes. But I felt like this was gonna be, I don't know, I don't wanna say problematic, but if I was, uh, for instance, if I was going to be trying to find a song to play, to set up to play live next, I'd have to make sure that one of my uh, one of these green grid areas uh, that I that this that my that what I'm going to be playing is within this realm. Well, what this means is I don't have access to. Let's say I wanted to play this clip of my kick and bass groove. I can't do that now unless I scroll back up to where it is and play it, and then go back down and find my track again, or 
you know, certain synth lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for me, it, I needed to find a better way of being able to play the music that I would like to play, play the full compositions I'd like to play, but still have access to trigger any of these synth lines, drum loops, whatever, you know, whatever needed to happen. So I started considering uh, something called Cliff X. Well, originally, what the original idea was going to be was a, I really don't like having to touch my computer when I'm playing. I don't want to have to like mouse around if I can avoid it. But I realized in this context, it might be a little unavoidable unless I set up ahead of time exactly what's going to play after what. And it's all set up just like this. And I just scroll down and play next after next after next. And uh, that kind of defeats half of the purpose for me uh, for this thing. I want to be able to decide what I'm going to play like maybe like 20 seconds before I actually play it, for instance, or something along those lines. Not really 20 seconds, mind you, but, uh, you know, I don't want it to be all set in stone initially. So, I started looking at Cliff X Pro. And one of the things that I, one of the initial ideas was to be, was going to be, okay, I just want, let's say I want this, this thing to play next, so I'm just going to copy it. And I'm going to use the command C, and then I'm going to paste it over here. And then we'll just launch it from the launch pad, because everything's already set up there. And I thought about that, and that was going to be the original way that I was going to do things. But I, it, I was like, wait a minute. I'm still going to like click on the right thing and do a control C and a control V. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of steps, and there's probably the propensity to fuck things up if I don't do it right. So maybe I can simplify the button pressing process a little bit, which is what led me to CliffX Pro. And if you guys don't know what CliffX Pro is, it's a uh, third party control surface script thing that basically uses Python to have really added functional control over many aspects of Ableton Live just by issuing commands in the naming of a clip or the naming of a track, or the naming of uh, an effect rack, or a, a, a MIDI effect rack, audio effect rack, instrument rack, any of those things. But it's very much a syntax-based way of uh, hacking around the control surface of, uh, of Ableton Live, which I found to be, uh, it's very handy for a lot of things. Like One of the things that I use, f use it for is to automatically change the song's BPM to the song that the track should be in just by launching the track. I mean, yes, it's not a gradual transition, unfor uh, unfortunately, but I don't care. If I really wanted it to be a gradual transition, then I would gradually take down the BPM or up to where, where it needs to be. But in this case, as long as I've got my programming of like, the songs that should be playing before and after, as long as it's not too wild of a tempo jump, should be okay. And I can always just get rid of the BPM uh, thing on here. You can just rename it and get rid of that. And then it's normal and it'll play at whatever and the tempo won't change. But in this particular case, as soon as I press it, you'll notice here at the tempo, it's 148 right now. As soon as I press this, it's immediately 146 now. So that's very handy. Yes, you can do this in the scenes as well, but for me to do it in the scenes, I have to launch a lot of clips, and I don't want, I don't want to do that. I, the, these aren't set up. My set isn't set up in rigid scene structure like this necessarily because uh, I, don't need, I don't really need it like that. So I looked at CliffX, and so they had a couple of... Uh, there was a couple of sets of commands that I was able to set up, and this is actually almost, it's too long to show in this way, so, well, it's actually too long to show here as well. Normally what somebody would do is set up like uh, the, one of their macros, but anyway, what I, what this command is, is from the selected track, I will copy the selected clip, and then into the first channel with the first empty is going to select the first empty empty clip slot in in track 1 and then paste that clip that's already been in the copier on the selected track 
because we've already selected track one and we selected an empty clip. So this will select that empty track and paste it, paste that clip exactly in that em em empty location that's been selected on track one. Now this one's the same for track two. I'll show you really quickly how that would work. I'll close this down because it's set up to a MIDI controller. Uh, it's set up to a, a two buttons on my MIDI controller, on my launch control. So I go back to my factory setting of um, my factory uh, template of three, where I have this set up. And let's say I want, and to show you that it doesn't have to be on channel two to go to channel two, we're gonna select a track on this one. So let's just select uh, Food for the Soul, which is, that's the name of this song. It's just backwards, because it was made for the Deep Festival, so yeah. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the second button on my controller. You can't see this, unfortunately, but now that I've selected this, this is highlighted. You see it's outlined in red, right? That tells me that this clip has been selected. So I'm going to press this button, and all of a sudden it's up there, ready to play. Easy peasy beautiful. Now, let's say you already have these two channels full. Let's say I didn't delete this after I was done playing it. If I'm practicing good DJ hygiene, so to speak, as soon as this track is finished, as soon as one track is finished, I'm gonna delete it. It's gonna still have me like touching my, my, my computer, but I've already decided that that's gonna have to happen. But if I can minimize how much I touch it, the better it is for me. So, but just in case I don't delete this clip and I wanna just load something up, Let's say I want to play Purple Onion. So I select Purple Onion. I'm going to load it into track one. And it puts it underneath because it's looking for the empty clips. If I had set it up to just load it into clip, uh, clip slot one on each of these channels, I could accidentally, hopefully not, but I could accidentally do that while something's playing and I could fucking stop the music, which we don't want at all. So that's how... Do the full playback action goes. Then I have uh, the ability to treat this like a DJ and mix this in. I'm also using uh, a Macrobat rack from CliffX that allows me to remotely control parameters on remote macro, uh, remote macros, remote uh, audio effect devices, etc. So I've got this set up to take care of my lows, my mids, my highs on these two channels, and then also to kill the mids and highs on the, what I would call the submixes channel, which this is how, um, this is how all this other stuff here gets routed together, which is basically all the components of more or less a song. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a little raw, a little rough, but it's meant to be like, okay, this shit's real. This shit's really, really live, warts and all. So, you know, to a certain degree, it's not, it shouldn't be too super, super horrible, but is why I'm practicing. Uh, so, yeah, so I can turn off the mids and highs of those particular uh, effect chains, which just works as, I just basically have DJ style EQs and I can access them from this particular channel, which is fine. I just have to remember that, you know, if I'm gonna do the, I've got two ways to mix. I can do the traditional DJ mix where I'm doing the lows, mids, and highs, but I also have the ghetto way that I normally rock, and it's just got a low cut, which I've got set to a couple of uh, buttons on my fader fox. So I just press the buttons, and it'll turn on and off low cuts. And that, that also works for a lot of situations. I mean, it, it all, I just wanted to have a lot of flexibility. So these are the first two channels. Then this is, you know, like almost a standard DJ set to a certain degree on that aspect. But then we got all this other stuff. And this is where things get really interesting. Now, I have to keep my processing at a reasonable level, unfortunately. I mean, for, you know, because of the concept of a performance where you really don't want it to sound glitchy and hiccups. So uh, it, so far, it's been okay. I haven't had uh, too much issues, but I am stress testing this. And if it starts freaking out on me last minute, one of these, one of these extra live things will probably go. And I'll just get rid of it, lower my processing down, because I'd rather, you know, I'd rather it be not 
as crazy of a live set than it to be like a you know a shitty performance where my computer's glitching out and is always giving problems to the dance floor. Ideally, but I really want to do something. So like this is so far how we're going. I've spent a lot of time over the years working on different aspects of this, and uh, you know I've had to make some concessions here and there, as you'll see with a couple of things. But yeah, uh, a lot of this. Uh, so I've got this channel is kick patterns and sequencing. Now, the reason why it's also sequencing is uh, somewhere in my MIDI routing, I have the output of this channel routed into this track. So not only is there kick, there's a kick, this is sequencing the kick, but it's also technically sequencing all these little parts. Now, all this stuff in here is gone because I was doing drum loops, but it was too heavy and I just haven't taken out these things yet, but there, it doesn't trigger anything, so it's a moot point. It doesn't cost any processing right now. But I've got, basically, this is all the outputs being sent to this, uh, my mega drum kit, which has, you know, it's got a kit switch so I can switch the drums that are in there because they're, like, I've basically set, rigged up, I think, 12 different drum kits. And so we've got the closed hats, open hat, snare, four different types of percussion, then a couple of extra like percussion hit things. Then this is for the sequencing purpose of like making it cohesive. I've got four and eight bar transitions because you need those to make it sound like an actual cohesive composition. So I have these grooves for a certain amount of bars that kind of mimic the structure of a song but only as regards to the kick, bass, and drums. Now, it doesn't say what notes are going to play in the bass. It only will just turn off the audio, uh, the volume of the bass, at certain sections when it receives a particular, uh, when it receives a particular MIDI, uh, a particular control signal, which I hope is set right. We'll, we'll see in a little bit. But when it receives MIDI CC57 on here, it should mute my bass line. So I can have all my little, you know, cut out the bass without having to mute this by hand or having it continually go in there. Which is important because I'm actually, this is the only clip for my bass line. I'm not running any other clips because I'm sequencing this live. And uh, i got to get rid of that because it's not actually controlling anything anymore. So I've tried several different ideas. I'm still not, I'm still trying to find a, a even happier medium with, uh, with uh, the way the bass thing goes because I like programming bass. I set this up so I can program the bass, but I can't always quickly do that when, if I'm trying to play other things. So in the future, I'll be thinking of a system to where I can, you know, play the notes and play a groove and the groove uh, will eventually o evolve over time, kind of on its own. I'm researching a few Macs for Live devices that might help with that, but for the time being, I haven't done enough research on it and I'm not confident. So, I've got this set up to my launch pad. It's, uh, it's got the ability to control up to four bars and I can sequence on the fly. So it's helpful, it's better than nothing, and it's better than having just one kick drum and bass note, you know, or just one particular thing, and I don't really wanna run audio because I don't know what grooves I wanna do in the live shit. This is actually like, you know, we're free balling it here, so to speak. Uh, so this is kick and bass, and these guys are just, I mean, I'm just launching these because this is a full, these are full compositions. These are like 64, 64 bar mini compositions that are set to follow action in between each other. So it'll create this kind of never ending groove that doesn't, I mean, it'll eventually repeat, but it's gonna be a long time before it really is noticeably repeating, I hope. And then down here towards the very bottom, I've got just playing like kick fills and just, just basic stuff to where I can really jam on top. There's no structure whatsoever. We're just jamming. And that might be helpful for like when I'm feeling really, really comfortable and we wanna just jam out for a little while before I play like another full composition or something like that. 
So that's the kick and bass channel. They are collapsed into a group for mainly to give myself the ability to uh, control the sub mixes right there. Because I was trying to do it a couple other different ways where I had like the kick and bass separate and then I was routing the output of the kick and bass bus group back into the kick channel later on and controlling that and just, I don't know, I didn't like what was going on. I wasn't 100% I wasn't solid in, in how it sounded. So I just went and did it like this. And I've got my drum kit, which we call the Mega Drum Kits, because it's got like 12 different drum kits in it, and uh, I'll probably eventually add more and more to it. Uh, the whole goal eventually will be to where there are uh, 128 kits, but I doubt that I'll actually be able to do that, because that takes a lot of processing, a lot of power, and yeah, no. So... It was a goal, but probably not an attainable goal with the level of machine that I currently have. So my drums change. I've been using this Grids uh, port. That's a Max for Life port. That's a port of the Mutable Instruments Grids, which is great, honestly. I, I enjoy it. I, I, I enjoy the thing. And it's great to put together, like, you know, some interesting patterns and, and stuff like that. So I swear that I had some more con swear that I had some modulation going on for this at some point. So I'll have to look into that again. And if not, I need to rig up some modulation for these parameters because I had some, but now they're not there. So I gotta fix that up. Yeah, I gotta fix that up. No big deal. Easily doable. I'll just work on that in the next day. Anyway. So I've got all these drum kits. Uh, I used to have, uh, I used to keep drum loops in here that were set up into individual simpler racks or sampler racks. Yeah, they were sampler racks, I believe. And it just didn't, no, they were simpler racks. They were simpler racks because they were all sliced or something along those lines. But it just didn't fly for me. It didn't really work. So I took them out and figure out another usage for drum loops that's not quite the way that I wanted it to go, but it'll fly for now. Uh, so those are my drums, and if I open up one of the kits, I'm using probability on some of these drums being triggered, you know, to see how often things might have probabilities going on. And just, just so if I were to maybe make a static pattern that was pretty repetitive. Just the probability of things happening or not will make it sound a lot more lively and a lot more like, you know, less robotic, less monotonous. So I think I have probabilities on, I have it on all my percussion. I know that for sure. I have it on my hi-hats as well, but not the open hat and not the snare because those are very important. I've got humanization on this snare to where it's gonna, Push or pull, it should push or pull about four milliseconds to give it a little bit more of a life-like drumming feel so it's not quite exactly on the beat. Kind of works. I mean, I, I, I employ, this, is, this is a technique that I generally employ in my compositions anyway, so, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, yeah. So, I've got tons of snares. I think there's 14 snares in here or something along those lines. So, now on to drum loops. And these are actually the very the most basic things of all they're, they're they are just audio clips they are audio drum loops they are the drum loops that i had uh either in those clips or in in the simpler instruments before or there's stuff that i might have made to go in like a few of these these freezes these frozen things or me sampling uh different synths that had uh, some interesting drum capabilities with them, so I've got some interesting possibilities out of that. So we're running a few of those, and it's pretty simple. These are super, super simple. They play for 32 bars, and they switch to something else. I wanted to do something more, but at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I do have to realize that I am doing quite a bit, or I can do quite a bit, and maybe I don't have to do everything completely by hand. So playing some drum loops, they're going to fulfill their role. It's an added groove. I'm not about, I mean, it's not meant, in this case, 
the purpose isn't for them to be glitched out and chopped up and rearranged and mangled in that particular way. They are rhythmic support. So uh, I incorporate them like that. Now, uh, when it came to adding synth lines, I was really, I really wanted to be able to play in synth lines using uh, either like synths, uh, either like a synth channel or using a drum rack where I have a whole bunch of different categories of synth stuff that I can do. I can just press certain keys and start taking, letting them go and, and having them go. And, you know, some things you have to press, some things you just hold down. It all depends. But, you know, you got to do something. But when I was doing some practicing with that, I was realizing that it's, um, it's not quite as fluid feeling. So you need at least one sound that's constant that's going. So I recorded, like, I think it was 24, or maybe even, it was even like 32 different uh, synth lines from various soft synths that I had. I just did this like in one day basically. And so these will play for an extended period of time, like, you know, however long, and then they will, I will either stop them. Actually, yeah, now, I don't think these, these are not set up for follow actions, even though I can, if I feel so inclined. These are not, these ones are not set up for follow actions. This white clip is a, uh, what it's doing is when I launch, when I press play on it and it launches, it's going to wait 16 bars and then we'll play any of these. I should actually rename that 10 through 38. So it's going to play randomly any clip in slots 10 in scene 10 to scene 38. So it will just randomly launch one of those clips. And then all, each one of these clips is a, the similar to the drum loops where it'll play for about 32 bars and then switch to something else. So that way there's constant movement going while I can jam out and the trigger leads or, and I don't have to worry about it until I've decided that I've had enough of that sound and it's time to move forward. So, the last thing I have I Actually, like, you know, most, all of these are meant to just be pressed, played in by, like, pressing the, the correct button that they associate with. I'll pull up my launch pad and, so. And so these have got different things going on with them. The staccato leads themselves, they are, it's very simple. I'm running an arpeggiator. I'm running my probability that has a note on lower possibility and also the note off being omitted possibility. So you get long notes, just like what you heard before when I was check playing. Check playing. I have to the button a couple of times before it did it. It's fine. It, it, I mean, in the context of like having a very interesting synth line, with short sounds and long sounds is fine. I just, you know, if I hear it like still going off, I just gotta press it a couple of times till it does it, till it turns off. But it's fine because you can get situations like this. Instead of. So I feel that that makes a very big difference. And it will seem like that there's you know actual synth work going on when really I'm I am just holding down a button to make this work. Now the next channel that one's called my play me leader, and it's called play me leaders because I actually have to like. I actually have to have to play in using my controllers. So I can't, I mean, if I just hold it. That's what you get. So I can't do the same thing as the staccato lead. So I actually have to like play it. 
which is fine. And this is one of the reasons why I set things up in this manner, to do that. So I have my, uh, and there's several sounds for me to choose from in that case, you know? Not as many as other things. I only set up like a few things in this particular case, but probably add more depending, depending on what's going on in the future. And this is just more like a proof of this will actually work <laughs> fully. So this is my Atmo Play channel, which is uh, a lot of the same uh, initial sources, but they're set up in a pad type of situation, which is very simple to do. Like, instead of a, if you want a pad instead of a lead, you turn up the attack, have it slowly fade in, maybe some filter sweeping in, and it's a little bit of some release on the end, and you can turn a lead into a pad in that manner, so to speak. I mean, the best thing about a lead is the staccato patterning and, like, the repetitive nature of it. The pad is, like, just back there, but it's still will serve the purpose. Fourth thing here is the, I have a copy of Basil, and I believe that that's, yeah, it's the uh, computer music version, so this is the freeware version of it. And I built a few patches for it, I've got program changes set up. So, if I press stuff, things will happen. I've just set up, I've created patches for the, for all of these that Really, as long as I'm pressing it, it should make an okay sound that'll work in the context of things. I don't make very much intentional melodic music, so I'm not really doing too much of that intentional, intentional melodies. Um, I do have this other channel that's called Riff Creation, and this one has a copy of Serum in there with my FM lead. It's also got something extra going on. It's got this interesting, what I call the output router. So what I have in this creation is I have a few MIDI effects that will generate sequences. Like, uh, well, I actually only have one now. I had a few more before, but I figured let's just keep it simple. So I, uh, so let's turn this on. And you can tell that, uh, okay, so when I turn that on, it starts sending a pattern through, and it's meant for, like, acid generation. Uh, this is called Sting from Skinnerbox, if you've heard of that uh, a legendary electronic music uh, group. And it's really nice. It's good for getting quick acid lines, so it's uh, great for, uh, I can, if I turn it all the way to the right, it'll randomize the pattern that goes through. And then I've got a scalar afterwards, so it just makes sure that it's in some permutation of C major. And then it's okay. Then on the output routing, I have several destinations I can send this to. Not only, right now it's being sent to Surge, which is the fourth output on it. But I could send it to my Surge channel, I could send it to my Basil channel, I could send it to my Play Me leads, or I could send it to my Staccato leads after uh, my style is done after the arpeggio. So I can send that pattern. That pattern generating thing can go to any of the other synth lines. And I will... So, I have this a bit of vari variability, so I can actually have a pattern that's constant and running, and I can route it to a few different sources. I probably might change the Atmo play up a little bit, um, make it a little bit later, because uh, this output routing initially was set up to where I could play on a keyboard, which I might still set up. So if I, could, if I wanted to actually play keys, for instance, I could uh, play use the keyboard functionality on one of my controllers or uh, use TC data, for instance, to generate MIDI note information, route it through my, uh, timing, pro my timing processor, and then go directly into that output router, which would then be routed directly into one of the synth lines. I could do that. Right now, I figure I've got enough on my plate to deal with, so we're not going to worry about that for this performance, but 
probably for future performances where the duration isn't as long, might uh, rig that one up too. Right now I can play all the synth lines the way that I need to play them, so it's okay. So yes, and then it's uh, my submixes channel, which is simple. I've just got some effects and I got some master effects on there that are being controlled by clip envelopes on this channel, on the kick and bass channel. Uh, and I'll open that up. It's somewhere in here. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's being routed through here to another place, and yeah, it, it, it's kind of tricky, but basically I'm remotely routing those parameters in places, so it'll, oh, this is the master effects, so yeah, the kick and bass effects are already on there, and they're, they're going to do their own thing, so that's fine. Kick and bass effects are actually on that chain. This is for master effects, and I think I set up some master effects somehow. I just can't really remember. Uh, I have a few different master effects, to be perfectly honest. But I can, okay, yeah. So I can, that's right, yeah. Yeah, no, I can just go here and affect it in this manner. So that's what we will do. And this will... We'll just move that up, move that over that way. That way, whenever I do end up accessing this track, this is the first thing that comes up because I don't have to worry about the DJ EQ at all uh, for the submixes channel. I've got that handled. All right, so we got the submixes, and the submixes is where all the output of the kick and bass to the trigger sounds outputs. This is where they all go. They all go into that particular channel, and they get summed, and I am doing some f serious processing on, the, on this thing, you know? Uh, it's pretty heavily processed in a lot of respects. Like, prob I wouldn't process it this heavily normally, but, or the, uh, the output this heavily, heavily normally, wait, is it here? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I know what's going on. So, yes. This is uh, controlling something else that's in there that'll control something else remotely. So, but inside the submixes, that's where I'm actually doing the processing. So, kick and bass is being routed directly to the submix bus because it's got its own kick and bass bus where it's handling that processing. Uh, synth bus, drum bus, they all get routed in here. Drum bus to make everything pretty loud and heavy. A little bit of glue compressor to take care of some of the peaks and raise, raise it a little bit to simulate a tiny bit of maximization. And then a little limiter. I'm just using native processes on here because I even with this stuff, I'm already like, heavy on my processor. I think I ride around, hover around 40% if I'm not trying to record video. So that's the line for me. And even then I had to take out a lot of stuff to get it back down there because I had a lot more stuff I wanted to do. But this thing, if I want this to be like 98% glitch free, then I'm going to have to sacrifice a few things and that's okay. It is what it is. So on this trigger channel, I have all these clips and they are set up with, um, I'm set up to, I've got this randomization thing that I'm doing where it, all it's doing is randomizing what uh, instrument, what instrument in each chain will be active when I'm at a certain point in time. And then I have some things where, this is kind of like the backing structure to certain elements of a song. It's only like a couple of elements here or there. Like, it's really only for the audio. And it's only for, honestly, it's only really for these three audio things where it's my chopped, my lead chops where these are clips or audio files that have been loaded up into simpler 
and I actually show the right thing. And these, these clips have been loaded into Simpler, sliced up by region, and I, because I know how long these are, these regions are usually about a bar. So I've got this randomly cycling between one bar sections of these synth lines. And then the long play is, much as you would imagine, it's more of a long play. Uh, it's as long as you hold it, which some could be good. Okay, yeah, they're all game. So I gotta hold these. I gotta hold that and keep it running as long as it's gonna play, which is fine by me. And then I've got my Atmo hits where, you know, you're gonna hit that. And those will go, and those are actually just triggered. And it's in the similar fashion of uh, what the other things were. Don't want that. But instead, we're just triggering, and I'm triggering like sometimes eight bars, sometimes four bar, but I'm triggering longer sections. And we just let it go and it does its thing, right? So I have a few things set up because it made sense to just have some automatic progressions, things going on. So I'm not trying to hit, you know, eight things, nine things at once and expect it to be good. So it gives me a little bit of breathing room. So I've got the leads that are changing. I've got like, and this is mainly only just the audio things. Like just those three might be pre-sequenced in, in a manner of speaking where it's going to happen every four bars that the Atmo hit thing is going to happen. And then the long play will happen eventually for a little while. And this is just so I can focus on playing the other five uh, things that I can be playing as well. And it'll sound like a cohesive piece of music because that's I don't want it to sound like you know, a bad loop jam. I really want this to be somewhat coherent and cohesive. So that's really the reason behind why I'm doing a lot of this stuff. Okay, so we've gotten to the basic nitty gritty. I have a master glitch, which I have, of course, everybody's favorite, D Blue Glitch 2. Yes, I use it. Yes, I own it. And it's for, you know, just master transition shit. I've got that set up currently on my crossfader on my Fader Fox, and so I can just crossfade over and get a messed up version of what I've got going on, and then cut back. This is great for some spontaneous, glitched up madness, just for a little while. And it's good to not have to search for it. All I have to do is just flick a button, and it's gonna change things in a way, and I don't have to do it forever. It just flick it over, let it do for a second, flick it back, we're good. Uh, make things easy, quick, because there's already enough to be working with. So this explains the software aspect of how I'm going to perform live. And this is what my setup looks like. And this is the way things most likely will look when I play at Jacunda Trans in Brazil. Now, uh, a little bit later, after my iPad charges a little bit more, I am going to do a run-through on this set and see how, how we do. Uh, and over the course of the next couple of weeks, that set will come out. Uh, the, video, the video recording of that set will come out. But most, maybe a little bit of, of it will come out this week before the new year, but the rest will be out after the new year. Okay. Thank you very much, and I'll see you later. Peace.